Bonjour à vous tous. Avant de commencer, je, suis, je voudrais vous dire que je suis vraiment désolée de, de ne pas pouvoir m'exprimer en anglais. Uh, first of all, uh, before starting, I would very much like to tell you that I'm very sorry that I'm not able to express myself in English. Habituellement, je m'en tiens, je ne je m'en tiens pas mes notes pour faire les conférences. Usually, I don't use my notes when I'm at a conference. Mais étant, étant donné que le temps est limité, je vais m'en servir pour essayer de m'en tenir à l'essentiel. But given the the fact that time is limited, I am going to use my notes uh, to try to remain adhered to what is essential here. Mm. Mais premièrement, merci infiniment de me donner le privilège d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. First of all, I would like to thank you infinitely for having given me the privilege of being among you today. Eh bien, je me présente, Marie-Paul McInnes. Let me introduce myself. My name is Marie-Paul McInnes. Avant toute chose, je suis la maman de ces deux magnifiques petits garçons. Before anything else, I'm the mom of these two marvelous little boys. Je suis bachelière en psychologie. I have a BA in psychology. Conférencière et auteur du livre La survivante. I'm a speaker and I'm the author of the book La survivante, The Survivor. Dans ce livre, mon témoignage raconte entre autres mes mes huit longues années d'enfer dans la violence conjugale. In this book, My testimony talks about, among others, my eight long years of hell in a family violence. Cette violence s'est soldée par l'assassinat de mes deux petits garçons, le 2 juillet 1996. This violence ended with the murder of my two little boys on July the 2nd, 1996. Mon drame s'est produit dans mon petit village natal de la Gaspésie. My drama took place in my little native village in the Gaspésie. Avec le recul, j'ai réalisé qu'il était encore plus difficile de dénoncer dans un endroit où les gens se connaissent tous personnellement. In hindsight, I realized that it was even more difficult to denounce it in a place where people know each other at the personal level. Le statut social et la réussite matérielle, bien en vue de mon conjoint, n'a fait qu'augmenter sa crédibilité et par le fait même, resserrer la mienne. The social status and the material success within reach of my partner did only created a situation whereby her credibility increased and at the same time my credibility was constricted. La honte et la peur du jugement s'est ajoutée à l'emprise déjà bien présente dans le cycle de la violence conjugale. Shame and fear of being judged was added to what was already there in this cycle of domestic violence. Sous le contrôle d'un grand manipulateur, j'ai dû redoubler de courage pour oser dénoncer. Under the control of a very big manipulator, I had to double my courage to dare denounce. À cette époque, euh, dès mes premières rencontres avec l'intervenante sociale et mon avocat, j'ai eu le sentiment que mes appréhensions et mes cris de détresse n'étaient pas assez pris au sérieux. At that time, from the beginning of my meetings with the social worker and my lawyer, I had the feeling that my fears and my cries of distress were not being taken seriously. Le simple fait qu'ils ont essayé de dédramatiser mon, ma situation n'a fait qu'augmenter mon angoisse et mon insécurité 
ce qui a permis à une plus grande latitude à mon agresseur. The only fact that they tried to de-dramatize my situation uh, uh, brought about as a consequence that they increased my anxiety and my insecurity, and this gave even more latitude to my aggressor. Compte tenu de la gravité de la situation, j'ai senti que je n'étais pas entendu. Given the seriousness of the situation, I felt I was not being heard. Puis vient le jour où mes craintes furent confirmées. And then the day came where my fears were confirmed. 21 ans s'est écoulé depuis la mort de mes deux petits garçons. 21 years have passed since the death of my little boys. Il serait faux de dire qu'aucun avancement n'a été apporté au sujet de cette problématique. It would be false to say that no progress has been brought in the matter of this problem. Cependant, à mon humble avis, il reste encore de nombreux changements à faire. Nevertheless, in my humble opinion, there are still many changes to do. Ma bataille contre la violence conjugale et les drames familiaux a été mon leitmotiv pour ma propre survie. My struggle against domestic violence and family dramas were, were my light motif for my own survival. La publication de mon livre m'a donné l'occasion de faire de nombreuses conférences et apparitions publiques, ce qui m'a permis de rencontrer et de discuter avec plusieurs victimes et divers professionnels qui sont en lien direct avec la problématique. The publication of my book gave me the opportunity to go to many conferences, to have many public appearances, and this enabled me to meet and have conversations with many victims and many professionals who are directly connected to the problem. Dans ces discussions, quoique flattée, j'ai tout de même été étonnée lorsque plusieurs d'entre eux Baignant dans le domaine, m'ont affirmé avoir mieux compris la complexité de ce phénomène suite à la lecture de mon témoignage. During these conversations, although I was flattered, I was still surprised when several among them that were immersed in the field affirmed to me that they understood the complexity of this phenomenon better after having read my testimony. Mon long combat m'a aussi mené vers l'idée d'un projet documentaire. My long struggle brought me as well to have the idea of a documentary project. En ce sens, j'ai regroupé cinq mamans qui ont vécu un drame similaire au mien. In that sense, I gathered five moms who lived a similar drama to mine. Ces victimes étant les personnes les plus directement touchées et affectées par ces drames, j'ai considéré qu'elles étaient une ressource clé en termes de prévention et d'intervention. These victims, being people that were the most directly touched and affected by these dramas, I considered them to be key resources in terms of prevention and intervention. Au sein de ce groupe, neuf petites innocentes victimes ont été froidement assassinées par nos ex-conjoints, c'est-à-dire le père des enfants. Among this group, nine young innocent victims were coldly murdered by our ex-partners, that is to say, the fathers of our children. Ces femmes, victimes de violences à divers niveaux, étaient tous dans un contexte de, vie, de séparation conjugale où des procédures légales au sujet des enfants étaient en cours. These women, victims of violence at different levels, were all in the context of domestic separation, where legal procedures in, matter of the, in the matter of the children were taking place. Dans nos longues discussions, un point en particulier a vivement retenu mon attention. During our long conversations, 
one point in particular strongly attracted my attention. Chacune d'elles a eu le sentiment de ne pas avoir été crue et comprise dans leur cri de détresse pour la protection de leur enfant. Each one of these women had the feeling of not having been neither believed nor understood in their cries of distress for the protection of their children. Une expérience similaire et plus que troublante qui m'avait anéanti 20 ans auparavant. A similar experience and an experience that was more than troubling that had almost annihilated me 20 years prior. Surprise qu'encore aujourd'hui, les victimes ne soient pas réellement plus protégées me prouve bien l'impuissance des ressources pour contrer ce phénomène social. Surprised by the fact that even today, these victims aren't really more protected, uh, this proves to me the impotence of the resources that exist to counter this social phenomenon. Au-delà du harcèlement et des menaces de mort de la part de nos conjoints, nous avons toutes demandé de l'aide et protection pour nos enfants, que ce soit à nos travailleurs sociaux, aux policiers, aux juges, à nos avocats, à la Direction de la protection de la jeunesse, et malgré l'énonciation de ces fortes appréhensions, aucune mesure sérieuse proportionnelle à la gravité de la situation n'a été prise. Beyond the harassment and the death threats that were made by our partners, we all asked for the help and protection for our children, be it from our social workers, the policemen, the judges, our lawyers, the director of youth protection. And in spite of us talking about our, our strong concerns, no serious measure proportional to the seriousness of the situation was taken. Plusieurs raisons justifiaient l'inaction de ces ressources. Avec Several reasons justified the lack of action of these resources. Les droits du père et des dossiers criminels vierges, qui bien entendu est très fréquent en violence conjugale, puisque la victime n'ont jamais dénoncé par peur de représailles the rights of the father and the clean criminal files, uh, which of course is a very frequent situation in domestic violence, given that the victim does not dare make a denunciation out of fear of reprisals. Il y a aussi l'insuffisance de preuve, la faible probabilité d'un drame familial, l'évaluation erronée de la situation, et un mauvais jugement de la dangerosité de l'individu et du risque d'homicide. There's also the matter of insufficient evidence, the weak probability of family drama, the erroneous assessment of the situation, and a bad judgment on, in the matter of the dangerousness of the person and the risk of homicide. Bien entendu, je suis consciente que ces situations sont extrêmement complexes et chargées d'émotions et, et de contraintes légales, mais l'état émotionnel, physique et mental des victimes ne devrait jamais constituer un billet, mais au contraire, il devrait être un outil supplémentaire pour détecter la gravité et la nature de la menace tout à fait réelle. Of course, I am aware that these are extremely complex situations. These are situations charged with emotions and legal constraints. But the emotional, physical, and mental state of the victims should never be a bias. Quite the contrary, this should be an additional tool to be able to detect the seriousness of the matter and the nature of the threat, which is totally real. La crédibilité accordée aux appréhensions, aux peurs, aux inquiétudes vives avant le drame 
est d'une importance cruciale. Now the credibility given to the concerns, the fears, the very vivid uh, fears before the drama are of crucial importance. À mon humble avis, on devra offrir aux intervenants concernés une formation spécifique sur les homicides intrafamiliaux. In my humble opinion, uh, there should be the possibility to give to stakeholders that are involved to give them a specific training concerning intra-domestic homicide. Et en ce qui concerne la protection des enfants, une mesure pourrait être mise en place pour un retrait temporaire de, des enfants pour les deux parents afin d'assurer leur sécurité tant que le danger reste à un niveau critique. And as far as the protection of children is concerned, a measure should be implemented whereby temporarily these children could be withdrawn for both parents in order to ensure their safety while danger is at a critical level. En ce qui me concerne, je n'ai eu le droit à aucun cours sur la violence conjugale pendant mes cinq années d'études universitaires après la mort de mes enfants. As far as I am concerned, I had the right to no course whatsoever concerning domestic, domestic violence during my five years of university studies after my children's death. Pourtant, ma formation m'ouvrait plusieurs portes qui pouvaient me mettre en lien direct avec ce type de victime. And still my training was opening me several doors that could put me in direct contact with this type of victims. Outre mon expérience personnelle, comment aurais-je pu intervenir adéquatement avec si peu d'outils dans des situations aussi complexes? Beyond my personal experience, how could I have intervened adequately with such few tools in such complex situations. En mars 2015, dans le cadre de la Semaine nationale du travail social, j'ai été invitée comme conférencière à l'Université d'Ottawa. In March of 2015, mm -hmm. in the framework of the National Week of Social Work, I was invited as a speaker to the Université d'Ottawa, the University of Ottawa. Suite à mon passage, j'ai reçu dans cette lettre la confirmation que des sessions portant sur la violence conjugale seront désormais données dans ce programme. After my participation, I uh, received in this letter, in a letter, the confirmation that sessions concerning domestic violence will now be given in this program. Il en est de même à l'Université de Chicoutimi, dans le cadre des cours en pratique infirmière. J'avoue, j'en suis particulièrement fier. Same thing for the Université de Chicoutimi, the University of Chicoutimi, in the framework of courses in nursing practice. I must admit, I'm particularly proud. La violence conjugale concerne tout le monde. J'ai sou souvent constaté qu'on associe encore ce genre de drame aux plus démunis de la société. Domestic violence affects or concerns everybody. And too frequently, I paid attention to the fact that this type of drama is still associated to the deprived, the destitute, the poorest in our society. Cependant, cette perception erronée a quelque peu changé depuis l'horrible tragédie du cardiologue Guy Turcotte ayant assassiné ses deux enfants en 2009. Still, this erroneous perception changed a tiny bit since the horrible tragedy of the cardiologist Guy Turcotte who murdered his two children in 2009. Dans le meilleur des mondes, une meilleure compréhension du phénomène dans toute la société pourrait faire une différence. In the best of worlds, a better understanding of the phenomenon in all societies could make a difference. Compte tenu des signes avant-coureurs avant un passage à l'acte, 
les familles, les amis et les proches pourraient intervenir s'ils étaient conscients de la dangerosité du phénomène. Taking, taken, taking sorry, into consideration the early warning signs before action, families, friends, relatives could intervene if they were aware of the level of danger of this phenomenon. Au contraire, L'entourage de la personne qui a été laissée nourrit souvent la rancune et la vengeance déjà bien établies. Ou à l'inverse, on juge encore inopportun d'intervenir dans une relation d'intimité. But quite the contrary, the close circle of the person who is left uh, feeds very frequently resentment and revenge, and that is already very established or uh, it is considered still inappropriate to intervene in an intimate relationship. Pour en revenir au documentaire, un manifeste de 22 pages y a été ajouté. Uh, let's come back to the matter of the documentary. A manifeste of 22 pages was added. Ce document, appuyé par plus de 15 000 signataires, porte principalement sur les observations de chacune des survivantes quant aux lacunes de, du système en ce qui concerne nos drames et de nombreuses recommandations s'y retrouvent. Je vous invite à le lire et à le visionner au www.lesurvivantes.com. This document, supported by more than 15,000 signatories, has to do with the gap, with the mainly observations of each one of the female survivors as far as the gaps in the systems go, in as far as our dramas and the many recommendations that are there. Let me invite you to read this document and to see it in www.lesurvivantes.com. Ce, manif ce manifeste qui nous a demandé un travail de longue haleine a été remis à tous les médias afin que la couverture médiatique de ce genre de drame permette de conscientiser la population adéquatement. This manifest that demanded from us work that was long term was submitted to all the media for the media coverage of this type of drama to enable the population to become aware in an adequate fashion. Mais il a été aussi remis à tous les ministres et tous les, du les députés du Québec but it was also submitted to all the ministers and all members of parliament in Quebec. Malheureusement, à part quelques poignées de main et sobres félicitations lors de ma présence en chambre parlementaire, personne d'entre eux n'a donné suite à ce magnifique document. Unfortunately, uh, besides a few handshakes and some serious congratulations, while I was in Parliament, none of these people made any follow-up to this wonderful document. Encore aujourd'hui, du point de vue légal, il y a peu de ressources pouvant assurer la sécurité à long terme des conjointes, qui en viennent tôt ou tard à se sentir plus en, sécuri en sécurité en retournant au sein de la dynamique. Even today, At the legal level, there are, there are few resources that could ensure long-term ter, long safety for female partners that one day or another could feel more safe going back to this dynamic. Se sortir d'un contexte est une chose. En sortir sauf en est un autre. Et en sortir sain et sauf en est un autre aussi. To come out of a context such as this one is one thing. To come out of it safe is another. And to come out of it in health and in safety, that's even another one. Il est triste de constater que les victimes sont ignorées des instances politiques publiques. Et il en est de même dans l'après-drame. It is sad to pay attention to the fact that victims 
are ignored by politic, political and public entities, and the same thing after the drama. L'IVAC, l'indemnisation des victimes d'actes criminels, en est un exemple flagrant. Uh, IVAC, the indemnisation des victimes d'actes criminels, is a very clear example. Suite à l'assassinat de nos enfants, nous ne sommes pas considérés comme des victimes, mais plutôt comme des proches de victimes. En ce sens, aucune aide nous est accordée. After the murder of our children, we were not considered victims, but rather relatives of victims, and in that sense, no help was given to us. Tout compte fait, j'ai cherché pendant plus de 20 ans la solution idéale qui aurait pu faire en sorte que mes enfants auraient eu la vie sauve. Uh, taking everything into consideration, for 20 years, I sought an ideal solution that could have made for my children to be safe and in life. Cependant, une en particulier me revient toujours en tête qu'il faudrait peut-être prendre la peine d'être analysé. Still, there is one thing in particular that comes back to mind that would maybe be worth being analyzed. Selon ma propre expérience, et dans tous les cas que nous avons explorés, nous avons remarqué que le conjoint commettant l'homicide, même s'il nous enlève ce que l'on a de plus précieux au monde, c'est-à-dire nos enfants, prend bien soin de prévoir des mesures pour diminuer au maximum le conjoint qui survit. According to my experience and in all the cases we explored, we paid attention to the fact that the partner that commits the murder, even if he takes away from us what is the dearest to us in the world, our children, makes sure to implement measures that take away from us as much as possible, us, the partner that is surviving. Dans de telles circonstances, la loi devrait contrecarrer des plans semblables. In such circumstances, law should counter similar plans. Aussitôt le cas est authentifié comme étant de nature criminelle, les biens et les avoirs de ces individus serait différé au profit du conjoint survivant. The minute the case is uh, considered authentic and as having a criminal nature, the assets and the belongings of these people should be given to the benefit of the surviving partner. Dans la nature égocentrique et narcissique de ces meurtriers, un tel amendement pourrait constituer une mesure dissuasive ou un signe avant-coureur s'il y a liquidation de ces biens. Uh, in the egocentric and narcissistic nature of these murderers, such an amendment could be a measure that could dissuade or could be considered a precursor if uh, there is a liquidation of the assets. Bien entendu, pour ne pas augmenter le risque d'homicide conjugal ou de familicide, il faudrait prévoir que dans un tel cas, les biens et les avoirs seront légués à, à la succession du conjoint assassiné, jamais au profit de l'assassin. Of course, in order not to increase the risk of family homicide or famicide, one should come to a situation whereby assets and belongings should be left to the partner and never to the murderer. Pour ma part, je suis certaine que mes enfants seraient encore parmi nous aujourd'hui si une telle loi avait existé. Je suis convaincue que mon ex-conjoint n'aurait jamais assassiné mes enfants, sachant que tous ces biens et avoirs si précieux me reviendraient ou reviendrait à ma famille. J'en suis totalement convaincu. On my part, I am certain that my children would still be among us today had a law like this existed then. 
I am convinced that my ex-partner would have never murdered my children had he known that his assets and his belongings that were so precious to him would have come to belong to me or to my family. I'm totally convinced. Pour terminer, en mon nom, en celui de mes fils, et de toutes les victimes qui ont si injustement perdu la vie. Je tiens à vous dire du plus profond de mon cœur un immense merci pour vos innombrables heures de travail pour notre cause. Vous avez vraiment toute ma reconnaissance. And uh, to end, on my behalf, on behalf of my sons, and on behalf of all the victims who so unfairly lost their lives, I would like to tell you with all my heart that I thank you immensely for your enormous amount of works, of, of, of hours of work for our cause. I really give you my gratitude. Avant de quitter, je voudrais vous dire que j'ai apporté quelques livres. Ils sont malheureusement juste en français, mais Bef cependant, je serai disponible euh, si vous avez des questions à venir me poser. Et euh, mon conjoint est avec moi, il est parfaitement bilingue, alors on va, euh, il va faire la, la, la part des choses en, entre euh, nos, euh, nos, nos discussions. Alors, euh, une fois encore, un immense merci à vous tous. Merci infiniment. Before leaving, I'd like to say that I brought a few books. Unfortunately, they're only in French, but I'll be available if any of you wants to ask me any questions. I brought my translator, my partner, and he's totally bilingual, and he will help us during these conversations. Once again, I thank you infinitely. Well, first of all, let me say how honored I am to be here. It has been an awesome day. I have learned so much. And if any of our opening panel are still here, um, I'll hear your words in my head forever. And um, I cried a lot this morning. And I t told somebody today, I guess when I stop crying, that I ought to get out of the work. So, we're charged with addressing safety planning for vulnerable populations. Um, and when I heard the opening this morning uh, from the elder, I didn't know much, I have to admit, about the seven fires prophecy. So, of course, you Google it, right? And I found out some more. Um, but I'm feeling like we are probably in an era where we do have to make those choices as a global planet, as a global people. And especially for someone in the States, I feel particularly vulnerable um, to a country's government that seems um, absolutely bent and determined to do more to befoul the earth and, uh, you know, make our waters full of disrespect. Um, and that it's, it's uh, my country seems to want to go down the path of more prosperity for the few. Uh, and so does our world, uh, rather than a good life for everyone. So, you know, I'm going to keep that in my head and do everything I can to change the policy in my country. Um, I'm, I like a lot of what Canada is doing now. Um, I'm always tempted to move north, except what keeps me, of course, in my country is these grandchildren. So all of you that have heard me talk, you know I always start out with pictures of the grandchildren. Um, and my piece here um, is to ask all of you if anybody after the presentation has any thoughts of how I get those incredibly privileged grandchildren to really deeply recognize their privilege 
and to recognize the biases that I know they're growing up with. You know, my daughter says, well, mom, you taught us not to be racist. But I'm like, yeah, but see, that's not good enough. You have to live it. You have to think about it every day. So if you have any tips for me, let me know. Now, what I'm supposed to do is talk about safety planning for vulnerable and marginalized populations. Um, and uh, what Myrna told me is, is the way it's defined in this homicide prevention initiative is aboriginal populations, immigrant populations, rural, remote. I would say we ought to add the LBGTQ continuum to that also. Now, I'll confess from the outset, I got nothing for you in terms of rural and remote. Um, the intimate partner femicide study was done primarily on urban populations. There's a few rural cases in there. But I am thrilled that there are so many people here that are thinking about it, and I'm looking to my colleague Donna to, to address it in this presentation. The danger assessment, which many of you know about, was developed for women. It's in order to help women recognize the danger in their relationship with an abusive man. Now, part of the danger assessment, in terms of its history, it was, I first developed it based on a small domestic violence homicide study in Dayton, Ohio, small town. And based on the work I did in that study, I realized I needed to work with abused women if I was ever gonna decrease murder of women. And so I started on a journey doing that, working in um, leading support groups and shelters um, in Detroit first and then in other places in the country. And also recognizing, teaching my students, my nursing students to recognize abused women in their practice, uh, talking to a lot of abused women and realizing they oftentimes were us underestimating their risk of being killed. They would tell me the story and I think, oh my goodness, that sounds way too much one of the, like one of those homicide cases I reviewed. But yet, I'm more scared than she is. And that's when I learned to recognize clinically that normal minimization, put it in the back of your head kind of process that women do, abused women do. And not all of them are at high risk, but those that are oftentimes underestimate their risk. So I developed the danger assessment getting the wording for the items, and it's available on the website. It's available for free. They promise me even if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it'll be up there for free. I've sold <laughs> my soul, not totally, but you know, the, the rights to, to Hopkins so that it will always be available. And the wording of the danger assessment came from the women. Uh, the notion of choking strangulation went on the danger assessment back in 1986 because women told me that that was one thing that scared them. That was one thing that made them think he might be capable of killing her. Um, and the original danger assessment, I've done the danger assessment myself with 2,200 women uh, that I have records of, and probably more than that. Um, so I've used it, and one of the most important parts of the, the danger assessment is the calendar. This makes it interactive. This helps her come to her own realization of the pattern of domestic violence it cuts through that normal minimization. Now, the calendar is built on the notion that she's strong, resourceful, smart. And like all adult learners, we learn much better, it's much more powerful if we see it for ourselves in our own situation rather than somebody telling us what to do. And this is a quote from a woman in Alberta, Canada. You actually see your own roller coaster ride. It's on the calendar. Now, the, um, it was further refined in the national US domestic violence femicide study. 
um, tested with ROC curve analysis, all of that's available. Um, and all of the articles related to the danger assessment are on the danger assessment website. We have also developed a version for immigrant women, DAI, immigrant women again in the United States, so it hasn't been tested further, needs further development and testing. We're working on that right now. But that's also available on the danger assessment website. We also have a DAR for same-sex female couples, um, and that we're continuing to work on also. We also have a DA-5, which is a short form for healthcare providers. It was actually um, developed mostly by a Canadian physician, uh, Carolyn Snyder, who's now in Toronto. Um, we have uh, revised and worked on that further, and we have a publication coming out on that in 2018. The DALE uh, was developed in collaboration with the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center in order to um, help them identify which cases of domestic violence needed to be handled by a high-risk team. So it's calibrated slightly differently than the other danger assessments in order to do that. Um, and uh, the, um, that DALE also, um, there's a publication coming out on that, but that's available on the danger assessment website. But that's around more around identifying cases that need heavy duty, highly collaborative risk management. Um, the, it's also in the Dove intervention, which is for pregnant women in uh, prenatal, either home visitation or prenatal care. That intervention has been tested and found to significantly reduce repeat domestic violence. That's also being used in the NFP, which is the um, uh, family partnership. It's the home visitation program. Oh, David Olds would just nurse family partnership. Got it. Um, and uh, Dana Jack and Marilyn Ford Gilbo are um, using the danger assessment in their home visitation programs. Um, and they're developing an intervention specifically for NFP nurses to do with domestic violence victim. The LAP is a short form of the danger assessment. And note, it's a lethality assessment protocol. It's not just a lethality assessment. There's a protocol that goes with it. And sometimes you hear people say, oh, well, we use the LAP. You know, we just ask these questions. And there we go. We know who's at high risk. The protocol that goes with it is that the police officer informs the woman or the survivor, and they're using it with males as well as females, um, that they are, are at high risk. According to the LAP, it's calibrated to overestimate risk. Um, and gets them in touch with domestic violence advocacy right there on the scene. Doesn't give them a phone number to call that they don't but gets them in touch with domestic violence advocates right there on the scene. Offers them the phone, they don't have to talk, but that's the protocol part. So it's not just, you know, and you may notice, all of these are intended to connect women at high risk with domestic violence services so she can make choices what to do. I wanted to give you a little bit of data from my collaboration with the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters. Carolyn Gerard is out there somewhere. Um, and uh, this project um, we did many years ago, but we wanted to keep track of what happened when the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters decided that the danger assessment would be used in all of their shelters as women were admitted within the first 48 to 72 or 24 to 72 hours after admission. So domestic violence advocates were concerned about doing that with the danger assessment. They were particularly concerned about the calendar, concerned that it would re-traumatize women. So that was in part why we embarked on this research. 46% uh, of the participants in this research were Aboriginal. 31% um, English Canadian, other visible minorities, 7% and 5% foreign born. So importantly, the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters 
um, wanted to modify the calendar, which anybody's free to do, anything they want to do to make it um, better for women to fill out. They wanted to add emotional abuse as well as the physical abuse, the one through five on the calendar. They wanted to add emotional abuse, financial abuse, um, sexual assault, and spiritual abuse, and how often that happened and put it on the calendar. One thing that we're doing now with all of our calendars is actually adding when um, choking or strangulation happens on the calendar. So we had 180 respondents who gave us in-depth, um, it wasn't in-depth interviews, it was they gave us open, the answer to open-ended questions about what it was like for you to complete the danger assessment and the calendar. And the thematic analysis, first of all, a lot of women said, yeah, it's hard to do. It's distressing, it's upsetting. A lot of women cried. But it was also part of a healing process. First of all, by increasing awareness, decreasing minimization. I, I love that quote about, I'm always trying to minimize my experiences. And she hadn't even been to support group yet. So <laughs> I don't know how she learned that terminology. Uh, so she already had that in her head. But then also women talking about it being a healing experience. Um, I love that uh, in terms of loosening my, loosen my breathing, which we know is something that we do when we do finally start to relax. Um, also increase their realization of danger. And the theme of strengthening resolve, those quotes, and those are just examples of quotes, there was many other women that said something like this, um, is what makes me feel like the danger assessment is worth doing in terms of strengthening women's resolve. So also we measured um, the outcomes, and those of you that are researchers in the room, this was lousy research. It was pre-post only. It was, you know, it's not, no control group, none of that good stuff, no follow-up over time. But just pre-post in terms of women um, marking their danger more after doing the danger assessment. Well, that makes sense. But the ready to take action significantly more. Ready to get help from the shelter personnel and ready to get help from police. So based on that work with Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, we also worked with the indigenous um, shelter directors um, and their staff in order to make the danger assessment more culturally appropriate for indigenous uh, women on the, in the on-reserve shelters. And so they came up with the DA circle design. It's part of the walking the path um, uh, project that was for children um, who were experienced, were in homes where there had been domestic violence, indigenous children. Um, so it was um, designed to be a little bit more culturally appropriate, um, using uh, culturally uh, significant symbols on the calendar, and also doing the calendar in a month process, more appropriate, I'm uh, not meant a season process, more appropriate to a medicine wheel type concept. And women, rather than the regular danger assessment calendar, women are asked to work backwards, you know, starting with yesterday and work backwards because we remember yesterday better than further back. But to take advantage of the more storytelling traditions, uh, women were, were told to dive into the, any season they wanted to and work backwards and forwards within that season to mark the abusive incidents um, as is done on the regular danger assessment. Now, we have not formally tested the DA circle, but the notion of safety planning based in part, at least, on the danger assessment is that women are aware of the level of danger in their situation, their risk of homicide. That's one piece of information that they need in order to do safety planning, I believe. Um, and ideally, coming to that realization herself, rather than being told. 
But if she is told, if it's by a health care provider or the police or a domestic violence advocate, look, you're at high risk. You're at, if you do the weighted uh, um, scoring on the danger assessment, you're at extreme danger. Um, that this gives her a, a, um, a voice saying, and she may have suspected it all along. We have some quotes from, from some other women. One woman said, hey, this is no news flash. I knew he was scary. But this does give me some backing to push the system more. So then the, the safety planning you can do is based in part on how dangerous he is. Um, and then the, um, then it, the safety planning needs to be contextualized to her situation, to her culture, to other sources of discrimination and violence against her, um, so that it's not just about her personal situation, so that it's also the context has to take into account um, and Diane Redsky was talking today about her program, the Spirit of Peace program, which I think is awesome, where is she, um, and she can talk to you more about it if you're interested. Um, then we developed the My Plan app. Now, Nancy Glass, my colleague, my friend, uh, was the one that first developed the My Plan app, but the danger assessment is in it. And importantly, I don't know if this will work, yeah. So the danger assessment, the woman is asked, first of all, a little bit about her background. If she says she's in a relationship with another woman, and you know there's problems in the relationship, there's some first identification that the relationship has issues. Um, the word violence is avoided at the beginning. Uh, let me back up a little bit. It can also be done by a family member or a friend. So if it's not by the woman herself and it identifies that at first, starts off with internet safety, app safety strategies, et cetera. There's a get out of this app and go to a planning your, I don't know what it is, your work life or something. Um, it goes straight to that if you want it to. Uh, so there, there is some safety strategies built into that app. You can see also see the little leaf that's on the front of it, and it just says my plan. So it's not a very, it doesn't scream out abuse or circle of safety or anything like that. Um, and then it asks her what her priorities are in life. Are her priorities for children, which, you know, every abused woman I've ever talked to that has children you know, that's number one. But if she doesn't have children, then the safety planning that's offered is not about children. Um, and then after it goes, and it goes through some relationship myths, and that, um, that's one of the things we're tailoring to indigenous women and in our work with them, my plan. Uh, then it asks the questions that are on the danger assessment and it scores it for her. And you can see there, it um, gives where she is on the levels of danger. And we did some work with some women that said, you know, six months later, they said, oh, I was in the red zone. I remember that about that app. I don't remember anything else, but I do remember I was in the red zone. <laughs> you know, so, but, so it's a powerful, um, message of where she is in terms of risk of homicide. Um, then it, it tailors, and it's brilliant programming, James Case is the person that programmed it, it tailors the safety strategies that are offered to her, to those back, that background information, to her priorities, and to her level of danger. And so this does not take the place of domestic violence advocacy, but it's an extra tool that we can use for people that aren't ready to talk to you wonderful, fabulous, best people advocates. And that's always one of the choices that's given is in the United States, it's the National Domestic Violence um, uh, Hotline. Now this has been, there is a Canadian version called ICANN that Marilyn Ford Gilbo has developed 
and they're, they've done an, an evaluation of it. Uh, those results are in, it's not yet published, and they're eventually planning to get it in the App Store also. Uh, the only one that's in the App Store now, both kinds of App Stores, is the My Plan. It's also iSafe in New Zealand, and the evaluation of iSafe in New Zealand was very effective for Maori women even though it was not specifically tailored that way. So what we're doing now in the United States, we're trying to develop an indigenous version of my plan. Um, I have a team of indigenous researchers that are in charge of it. Uh, we started out with in-depth interviews of service providers and abused indigenous women. It has, it's, it will have the DA circle in there for the danger assessment. Um, by the way, in my plan, if you say you're in a relationship with this, um, a, a, another woman, you get the DAR rather than the regular danger assessment. Um, we're um, tailoring the priorities, the myths, the safety planning strategies for indigenous women in the United States. We'll get to Canada one of these days. Um, and we're also doing the same thing with the same grant money from NIH, so we can't go global. But um, is, and we're calling it, by the way, our circle. You can see a pattern in these things. Um, and the immigrant version of my plan is, is gonna be called We Women. And it's based on the danger assessment for immigrant women, doing the same kinds of cultural adaptation as for our circle. Um, like, for instance, in our, um, our circle, um, a lot of the safety planning strategies are reconnecting with your spiritual um, practices, your traditional practices, um, those kinds of things like what I've been hearing about today. I can, that team here in Canada, um, like I said, the, the findings are in press, and there's an I Heal um, online strategy that was also developed by Marilyn Ford Gilbo for healing after abuse. Um, and there's a team in uh, BC, Colleen Varco and her team in uh, working with Aboriginal women um, for healing after abuse. And I do believe healing from the trauma has to be part of safety planning strategies that we have to pay attention to healing. And I think we have to pay attention to that in our prevention programs, our dating violence prevention programs. We have to pay attention to people's experiences of trauma, whether they're Aboriginal or immigrant coming from another land, et cetera. That has to be part of our, our safety planning strategies. And I finished on time, what do you think? <laughs> Children. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, wow, they left her to last. Maybe they thought the time would all run out. But really, it's because children are in rural and remote communities. Children are in immigrant and refugee families. Children are in indig indigenous communities. And children are with their mothers. They're with their parents. And so we not only have to look at children and safety planning in terms of their developmental stage. What do we do when we're working with children and we're talking safety? But we have to also look at that child's context. Which of these contexts is that child in? And then adjust the safety plan accordingly. Now, I've watched how fast 15 minutes goes. So I'm just going to fling through my slides, just saying some of the things that I think are most important. The first is that when we want to do safety planning, obviously that's to increase safety with children. But it's about personal agency. It's how within a given situation to increase their ability to stay safe, to cope. The challenge with safety planning with children is how, and youth is how to do that 
without increasing their sense of responsibility for everyone's safety in the family, including their mothers and their own. So it's a delicate balance and the messaging and the way we do that safety planning, it is important. I believe it can be done, but we need to always have in mind how do we do safety planning without adding to their sense of responsibility or guilt. When we do safety planning for children, one of the dangers is that somehow it becomes segmented because there's a lot of different systems involved with children. Child protection services, children's mental health, and there's a lot of a separation at times and lack of collaboration and coordination. And safety planning for children must be one piece, an essential piece, but one piece of a broader, collaborated, coordinated community response that involves safety planning with their mother and they should be aligned. And we must never lose sight that for the most part, a child's safety and well-being is directly related to the safety and well-being of their mother. So we can't isolate safety planning with children and youth. We need to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture in terms of risk assessment, risk management, safety planning for the adults, but also safety planning for children. We also need to make sure that we're actually talking to the child and listening to the child. And when we talk to that child, that means joining with the child where they are, finding out their language. In most cases, that means they're not gonna talk about domestic violence, they're gonna talk about the fighting that happens in their family. They're gonna talk about dad's temper um, and, and how concerning his temper is, but they're not gonna talk about domestic violence. We have to listen to their experiences and what we know about children is they're not passive participants in the drama in their home that's happening. They're active participants. They're worrying. I have not met a child who lives with violence who isn't already engaged in some type of safety planning. From our perspective, we may feel that their safety planning may put them at increased risk, but there's elements of that safety planning they're already engaged in, blocking out the sounds, turning up that TV, putting on headphones, hiding under a bed. There's elements of what has come natural to them that we can usually build on in terms of a safety plan. The reason we wanna build on it because is what's come natural to a person, that's their instinct, and if we build on that, we're more likely to have success with the child. We mentioned the developmental stage. Safety plan, sometimes you'll read a, a brochure on safety planning, and it gives you the idea that if we understood safety plans for children, that you, there's just a safety plan, and we do it with each child, and yes, we um, may change it just a little bit, but no, they need to be very individualized. Just as Jackie was saying, safety planning for adults, for women, needs to be individualized. It has to be individualized because of their age and developmental level. Remembering that age and developmental level don't always go together. We need to be aware of mental health concerns and physical health, all of these things. The relationship to the parents. I think of uh, Maha's talk this morning in terms of um, coming from Lebanon and not wanting to make that call to police because you don't call authorities in her culture. And then if we understand that about relationship to parents and the context, then we adjust the safety plan, even knowing there's key components to a safety plan, to be more likely that it works for that child. We also need to take into consideration the circumstances. Is there access to the abusive uh, parent? 
And what does that look like? What's happening? What's already in place for safety? And we need to take those things into consideration. And we may need a special safety plan for when the child is spending time with the parent who's been abusive. Is the child also experiencing abuse? Have they experienced abuse from the abusive partner? And all of those circumstances need to be taken into consideration. The other thing is, like with all safety plans, we have to revisit and revise them regularly. We can't do it once in our busy schedules and check that's looked after because circumstances change. And that's the advantage of collaboration and working together because perhaps if a child is at school, then there's a change that's noticed by a teacher or a change by a mental health counselor that if they're in the know and aware of the safety plan, the risks and the safety factors, then we're more likely of not letting something fall between uh, the gaps and we're more likely to be able to wrap around that child. So there's core safety messages that make um, most safety plans with children. The first one is that we need to have them go somewhere that's away from the fighting away from the loud noises and the arguments. And of course, that's going to be developmentally appropriate. Little ones, we don't want them going outside their house, especially not in Canada during the winter, but any time. But for teenagers or older children, that may be a safe place. We're not asking them to hide. We're asking them to go to a place that's away from the fighting. We also don't want them to get in the middle um, and for especially older children, uh, uh, adolescents, they may have a strong need to stop that fighting, to intervene to protect the parent that's being harmed, their mother. And so in that sense, they may want to intervene. In safety planning, we want children to understand that they can help themselves and their mom most by not intervening. But there may be other ways they can help, like getting to a phone that's not where the fighting's going on and calling for help. So that's another part of the safety plan, um, calling uh, for help. And again, just as in an immigrant and refugee family or listening to Dawn and talking about colonization and the distrust with law enforcement agencies, that may not be an option to call the police for an indigenous child either. But there's other people to call. And who is someone that's close? Who is someone that can be a support in the immediate or in terms of longer time. And one of the things, the Kids Helpline, we all know about the Kids Helpline, but one thing that I'm not sure that everybody knows is that they can do a three-way call. So that child doesn't have to call the police, but the Kids Helpline can bring in help as they see fit. The other message is you're not alone, and children often feel alone, and they need to know that they're not alone, and that they're not responsible, they're not to blame for the violence, and they can be uh, a help um, in, in many ways, but they're not responsible. And I think that the message we want them also to understand at whatever age level is appropriate is that domestic violence or fighting, it's dangerous. It hurts and it's not okay. I think the other thing in terms of blame is helping children to understand that you can't make someone be abusive towards yourself or somebody else. That people choose their behavior. And I think that for some children that's helpful. We're not going to look at all of these factors, but there's a number of additional considerations. Um, the trauma that a child may experience and how that may impact their ability to keep themselves safe. With children, we're not just looking at physical safety ever. We're looking at psychological safety too. So when they get to that safe place, what might help them feel better? Is there a stuffed toy 
for a little one that's in that place? Or is there a headphone and a song that they can play if they're older? So we're looking at psychological safety too. Repet repetition and simplicity can't be stressed enough. And the more it's practiced, so we're not talking about one session safety planning with children and youth. We need more than one session. And we need to be able to have the repetition. I think that we sometimes forget siblings. Siblings are amazing with each other in many cases, and older siblings are so protective. But we also need to think not just doing sibling planning, because a sibling may be away from home. And we need to think about, and, and what would be the safety plan if Jane or John, your older brother and sister, is not at home? And what would that look like? And we can never forget schools. They play such a role with some of the prevention and some of the calming activities that can be helpful when a child is in their safe place. Programs like Mind Up is amazing in terms of helping children with that. Dating violence, the fourth R, unhealthy relationships, safe dates. Some of those programs, children are already learning safety um, procedures. So there's lots of ins and overlaps. And the more we can reinforce messages that they're already getting, the better. I wanted to uh, leave you with a recommended resource. <clears throat> There's lots of literature or increasing literature on children in, exposed uh, to domestic violence. The bulk of that literature is still on the impacts experienced by children. A smaller amount is on interventions. And within that intervention literature, a very little bit is directly focused on safety planning. But we can learn a lot from the hidden nuggets within the literature, as well as from our leading advocates in North America and around the world. Um, and I think that one of the best compilations of the information that exists was done by the BC Society of Transition Houses and um, EVA. Ending Violence Association of British Columbia, with support from a multi, um, an advisory committee that was made up of multiple agencies. And the name of it is Safety Planning with Children and Youth, a Toolkit for Working with Children and Youth Exposed to Domestic Violence. What I want to tell you is there's actual examples of safety plans, there's links to online examples, there's actual scripts that are appropriate for different developmental stages, um, and lots of special considerations, like when it's custody and access issues, et cetera. And they've done a marvelous job. So for anybody who wants to learn more, I highly recommend this resource. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and uh, thank you, Peter and Myrna, for the opportunity to speak here today. It's an honor to be speaking to you today and in this place and with my uh, esteemed co-panelists. Okay, so in its second domestic homicide brief, the initiative said that those conducting risk assessments should use structured, reliable, validated, and defensible risk assessment tools or guidelines. So the initiative doesn't have a position on which approach or which tool to be using. Um, and you, at this conference, have been hearing about a number of tools that are structured, validated tools. And I'm going to be focusing on one approach, uh, the actuarial approach, and in particular on the Ontario Domestic Assault Risk Assessment, or which is an actuarial tool. So actuarial has to do with the statistical calculation of risk. It's an approach that's used in many fields, including the insurance industry and medical health, and as it turns out, in a violence uh, risk assessment as well. Uh, actuarial methods have to do with measuring uh, risks or potential risk factors at a given point in time and then following up uh, a sample or a group, in this case domestic uh, offenders, for example, following them up and measuring the outcome as well. So that every item that's on an actuarial tool is a risk factor that uh, has been shown to be measured at one time and related to an outcome at a later time. So this, um, an actuarial tool is scored. Each item on an actuarial tool has a score, and the total score um, is um, the uh, conclusion of the, the tool uh, to an extent, is the sum of all the item scores. And that sum relates to uh, an individual's estimated risk and also a rank order, so how an individual compares with 
other domestic offenders who have been assessed. So as I said, uh, actuarial tools are used in a variety of fields, including uh, medical risk assessment. And I was actually able to go online and evaluate my own risk of developing breast cancer. So this tool allowed me to enter my individual level, my own information, and it told me two things. One, it told me what my risk of developing breast cancer is in my lifetime, up to the age of 90, which might be a little optimistic. Um, but uh, secondly, it also told me how my risk compares to others based on uh, large studies. Um, so an actuarial tool can tell you both individual information to help you either communicate to uh, a victim that you're supporting or uh, help you make decisions about an individual perpetrator that um, uh, you may be treating or uh, deciding on a variety of different risk management strategies for. But it also helps at a more population level or policy level because uh, planning can be made for how many people you may expect to need certain resources for. And in particular, actuarial tools fit with the risk, need, and responsivity principles whereby we give the most risk management interventions or actions to those people who represent the highest risk of either perpetration or victimization. So the ODARA being an actuarial tool gives this kind of information. Um, it can be presented in a figure like this, so for people who are comfortable with reading figures or enjoy the statistics, um, this table, uh, this figure can tell us a number of things. First it tells us that with increasing ODARA scores along the bottom, you see increasing risk of domestic violence recidivism. Um, it also tells us that, um, shows that we have done a number of studies and found the same pattern, validating the ODARA in different studies. The line also shows the distribution or um, uh, a summary we can take from that is that at the extreme ends of risk we see relatively fewer perpetrators and this is based on research with um, male perpetrators of domestic violence. The results don't have to be displayed in a figure like this. They can also be summarized in a table that we would call an actuarial table. And here um, you would find the ODARA score uh, down the first column, and you can look over to see uh, an individual's estimated risk in the next column. And perhaps more importantly, the other columns also show where an individual stands with respect to others who have been assessed on the ODARA. It can also be communicated like this, uh, and this, these pie charts were suggested to us by nurses who were working with um, victims, female victims of domestic violence at Ontario's sexual assault and domestic violence treatment centers. They found this was a more um, user-friendly communication for their clients, but it still also shows the estimated risk in the shaded areas of the graph and where um, people stand with respect to each other by looking at the whole row, the whole column of the pie charts. It can also be expressed like this, which to me is quite user-friendly and very similar to um, what I received when I assessed my risk for developing breast cancer. So I've mentioned the ODARA. I haven't really talked about um, what the ODARA is other than an actuarial tool. Uh, this is a screenshot from ODARA 101, our online training for the tool. Um, and this is a piece that you would see after doing the learning modules and when you've uh, been through some practice videos and you get the opportunity to practice scoring um, the ODARA and each individual item. So the first few items have to do with the perpetrator's criminal history, such as prior domestic assault and a police or criminal record. Um, um, the three items after that have to do with things that occurred at the most recent domestic assault, like threats, confinement, the victim's concern about future assaults. And the remaining items have to do with aspects of the relationship and the circumstances, their children, any assaults during pregnancy, uh, barriers to accessing support, and so on. So that's just a brief summary of the ODARA. And now I would like to talk a little bit about choosing a risk assessment tool. Um, I have just picked out five different uh, principles in choosing a tool, and each agency or jurisdiction uh, needs to choose the tool or the approach that is right for them, that's going to be the most effective in supporting their risk management procedures. So validation refers to uh, whether a tool has been tested, especially in um, multiple studies, to make sure that 
the tool itself or the items on that tool or the uh, the summary statements from that tool are actually related to domestic violence recidivism in, in the case of the tools that we're talking about. And all the major tools that you're hearing about at this conference have been validated. I would include in validation inter-rater reliability or agreement, that is, if I score the ODARA in a particular situation and Peter scores the ODARA in the same situation, do we come up with the same score? Because if we are scoring the ODARA differently, if it's a different score every time, then it can't be used in a valid way. Um, and we have done a number of studies on the ODARA finding that we have good agreement in that way. Generalization has to do with, okay, we've maybe validated the tool in one sort of population. Does it generalize to another population? So here's where we want to see studies done in different countries and so on, um, and, or, or in different settings, such as the victim advocacy setting or the police or correction setting. Um, Generalization also uh, for in domestic violence risk assessment, there is a big issue with uh, whether tools that are developed for male perpetrators with female victims will generalize to female perpetrators or to perpetrators, perpetrators and victims in a same-sex relationship. Um, we, we do have a number of studies now validating the ODARA for female perpetrators, and we want to see more happening in, in that direction. And we are hoping to see more work done, or at least some work done with the ODARA in same-sex relationship violence. Um, and that really is an area that is a current challenge for domestic violence risk assessment for all our tools. Information has to do with whether you have the information needed to complete the risk assessment tool or approach that you want to use. Uh, for example, the ODARA was developed for frontline use uh, with victims or in policing circumstances. Um, and uh, but we have a sister tool called the DVRAG that requires using uh, the psychopathy checklist, which is a restricted psychological tool that takes a lot of background information. So in, depending on your circumstance, you may not be able to use that tool. So that's part of that decision about the choice. Communication is another issue. Is this something, uh, a tool that's gonna help you communicate back to the people you serve, to, perhaps to share the information um, with uh, a victim who has given you her information? How do you share that back with her in terms of a risk assessment result? And does that help her um, make decisions about her own safety and move forward? Is this a tool that uh, police can use also to communicate with the courts or, that, or with um, probation? And can shelter staff um, use this tool with their clients and then uh, communicate with their local policing services about the level of risk uh, in, in an individual case or in general in the community that they're serving? Um, and my final point is about education. So you've selected a tool, can you access the education that you might need? Is there education needed for this tool? Uh, is it accessible? Is it affordable? Is it uh, timely? Can you get uh, your, if you have a, a crew of staff you want trained, can you uh, make sure that your training needs are met? So I've said a little bit about Adora 101. I'm not going to say any more at this point, uh, but we do have a showcase out there in the break if you want to come see me there. So just in summarizing about uh, risk management and safety planning, I think both of these processes consist of all the decisions that we make, whether it's about um, a perpetrator, we need to decide uh, what's going to happen, or uh, in a victim's case, if um, they're deciding, uh, making a number of decisions for their own safety. Uh, we make decisions with relation to risk management and safety planning all the time. And it's always with some notion of risk in mind, whether it's a gut reaction, a gut sense of what this perpetrator might be capable of, or whether it's a structured, validated, uh, scored tool, or however it may be. If we're using structured, validated tools, we can increase the effectiveness of our risk management and safety planning. Actuarial tools especially are designed to work with the principles of effective intervention so that we can be doing the most intensive, uh, the most extensive, the broadest risk management for perpetrators who represent the highest risk. And we can be planning for this at a policy level as well. Oh. 
Okay, well, then, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and uh, I will hand over to our next speaker. Thank you. It's uh, a pleasure to be here to talk uh, about uh, this challenging topic. So uh, we had talked about uh, how to make this sort of the most practically useful talk, and uh, well, at least I talked about this with Peter. Um, and uh, we thought talking about this issue of linking intimate partner violence uh, risk assessment to risk management is a very important one because uh, it's always been our philosophy that uh, risk assessment is nothing without good risk management uh, plans. Risk assessment is nothing if it can't inform us about actually what to do with the case. Um, uh, and so, but before I get into that, um, I think I've got a. I had to put this in here because uh, I'm, I, when I was putting these slides together, my daughter emailed me this picture. This is the puppy that um, she's finally getting after asking for a puppy for five years. So I thought it can't hurt to show a puppy at a conference like this. Yesterday was really heavy, so. Um, I'm pretty excited to meet uh, this little girl. So, uh, so we've, uh, I learned the hard way when I first started doing threat assessments. Uh, I can remember I was doing a dangerous offender assessment. I went through and I thought I was pretty smart and I went through and I used all the available tools. It was a sex offender who had also had a history of domestic violence. And uh, I, get, I did my risk assessment, I sent it into the court, and I got a polite response. Thank you very much, Dr. Kropp, but could you provide us with some uh, useful information? And I thought, well, uh, and I almost retired at that point. But uh, the, the response was, can, can you actually tell us what to do with this case? Because what we're struggling with here in court is, uh, can we manage this person in the community? If we place him in the community, how can we prevent him from reoffending? So that actually, that experience and others uh, really influenced our approach to developing risk assessment measures. And the whole idea would be, can we develop something like the SARA, which was the Spousal Assault Risk Assessment Guide, was the first tool we developed. This sort of a one-stop shop, one -stop shopping where we can actually guide people through the entire process of risk assessment and uh, to the point where they're making good risk management plans. So it's a process that we're actually trying with the tools that I've been involved in developing that we're trying to actually help people through. We think people, you know, regardless of where you're working, whether it's victims, offenders, uh, you are doing risk assessments, threat assessments anyways, um, whether you're using a tool or not. Uh, we wanted to, to basically guide you through that process in the most structured way possible. So there's sort of four general principles or steps that you know, I would suggest are important. The first is to identify risk factors, then to think about the actual relevance of those risk factors, to think about risk scenarios, and then build management plans on top of those scenarios. So let me just walk through this. So when we're thinking about identifying risk factors, we'll have, you've seen lots of risk tools and you know there's lots of these lists of risk factors and I echo uh, uh, Zoe's thoughts about this. We have to focus on risk factors that have some empirical relevance uh, in the literature whenever possible. So we want risk factors that have been validated in the literature and uh, show some predictive accuracy. Um, our approach is a little different in that we would also want to include risk factors that we believe might be difficult to empirically validate, but might have some professional um, and practical utility in the, in the sense that, that the professional consensus out there is that you know, there are some risk factors um, that are important to consider that may be difficult or rare or hard to validate. Uh, and then there's the whole legal question about using risk factors that are fair, uh, that um, don't discriminate, they don't use ascribed characteristics of individuals. So, you know, we can't talk about skin color even if there was, uh, you know, an empirical association between skin color and violent behavior. It's unhelpful to, to do that, it's discriminatory, um, and it's not actually addressing what the underlying risk is. So. Uh, risk factors need to be fair and reasonable. 
uh, you'll see, uh, you know, uh, I agree with uh, Zoe that we have to use structure. Uh, if, we, if we do threat assessments without any structure, uh, we do not get reliable risk assessments. It's as simple as that, and the literature and the research is pretty clear about that. Uh, risk assessments need to be contextual, so we need to uh, uh, always think about the individual case that we're assessing uh, and think about the context in which that violence is occurring in that family. Uh, so we believe in thinking about static and dynamic and flexible risk factors in the assessment. So this is just the be safer, so this is an example of the structured professional judgment approach to risk assessment. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the Be Safer. It was like our uh, shortened version of the SARA. Uh, so you can see we have risk factors related to the violence itself. So we think about violent acts, threats, escalation of that violence, violation of court orders, and attitudes that support or condone violence. We think about the uh, psychosocial adjustment of the perpetrator. So think about general criminal attitudes, behaviors, in intimate relationship problems, substance use pro problems, excuse me, mental health problems and so forth. And then finally, victim vulnerability factors. Um, attitudes and behaviors of the victim, uh, and, and this is not, of course, to hold victims responsible for the violence that's being perpetrated against them, but it's understanding the vulnerabilities and barriers. So uh, fear, support networks, living situation, health problems, and so forth. So a lot of you work with victims. This is basically the, the stuff of a good safety plan. This is important because, again, we're going to see that risk management, as, as I define it, will include um, victim safety planning. Um, we can't do risk management of the offender without considering victim safety planning with the victim. It's two sides of the same coin. So the next thing is, think is well, risk factor can be there historically, but is it actually relevant? I mean, we can go through a list of risk factors and, and check off a number of factors, but we don't actually think they're relevant right now to the risk that this person poses. So we ask people to think about, does the risk factor actually have some kind of causal relationship to this person's violence? And I'm talking about this later this afternoon in more detail, but you know, we can think about relevance in a number of different ways, but we think about, does it motivate the person to be violent? You know, is he motivated by revenge, or is he motivated by power and control, or is he motivated uh, <coughs> by um, uh, proximity to the victim, affiliation? There's a number of different reasons why men uh, are violent, and women. Uh, the other thing, the other way a risk factor can be relevant is actually just going to complicate management for us. So it's going to make us it difficult to implement good uh, management uh, strategies. So a risk factor can, you know, we, we take a decision-making model with risk assessment and we think that violence is a decision. Uh, and what we want to try to understand is why is this perpetrator deciding to behave this way? Uh, so we want to try to, in a way, get into uh, his head and think about what's he trying to accomplish, what might be disinhibiting him, so preventing him from appreciating the consequences of the behavior, both to himself and to the victim, and then what factors might be destabilizing him, screwing up his thinking, just um, affecting his ability to make good decisions. And it's risk factors that are impinging on the decisions, and that's, that's how we decide which risk factors we want to really focus on. This isn't as difficult to do as you might uh, expect if we actually um, uh, put in some structure to the process. The next stage we would talk about is developing scenarios. Now, uh, this again is a process where we want people to step back and think about what bad things are we worried about here. Now, this is something that we do naturally anyways. I mean, anyone that works with victims or offenders has those sleepless nights. You're thinking, what? is going to happen tomorrow. Is that guy going to do it? Is he going to kill her? Is he going to uh, abduct her and the children? Um, we are running these scenarios, usually very bad scenarios, uh, through our heads 
all the time. And that's how we think we build good plans. We can't build plan, we can't build management strategies without having a good plan and without understanding what it is we're worried about that the perpetrator is going to do. So we have to think about what that person's done in the past. So we look at all the past and previous patterns of their violence and that's going to tell us a lot. We also want to consider any development of new patterns of behavior or evolution of IPV. And we can do this kind of by considering a number of different scenarios. So the easiest one for us to think about always is the repeat scenario. We can think about, uh, uh, what, you know, is it likely that this person just going to continue doing what he's always been doing, the same sort of simple uh, pathway. Now that, the problem with only considering that is that offenders are creative. They can change. They evolve. So uh, we have to not just assume that violence is always going to be the same. Uh, a, a threat assessment has to consider a twist, a possible change in the motivation, uh, the victims. We know that there are possible multiple victims of violence, not just the, maybe the obvious person, but it might be the new boyfriend, the children, the mother-in-law, and so forth. Um, are the behaviors going to change? So thinking outside the box, that's how we prepare ourselves. This is, what, this is how people do this in emergency planning. We have to think what, you know, if an earthquake were to hit Vancouver, that's my hometown, um, tomorrow, are we prepared? We do that by trying to imagine all the different possible outcomes. The one we're always concerned about, and it's relevant to this conference, is lethality or worst case scenario, and I'm going to be talking about that in some detail this afternoon. We always want to ask that question. Is this going to escalate to lethal violence? And if it is, how does that unfold? What is going to have to happen for that to take place? If we can do that, now we start to, to get somewhere. We're just thinking about what warning signs we're going to be looking for. We, of course, want to imagine an improvement scenario. Sadly, um, those aren't always uh, very common. So always consider in our scenarios the nature, severity of the violence, the imminence of the violence, the likelihood, and as I said just a minute ago, think outside the box on the victims. Because again, it's, uh, we can have multiple possible victims. We can even have multiple perpetrators, right? So if we think that uh, in extended family violence, sometimes we call this honor, so-called honor-based violence, or, or, or uh, in a scenario of that nature, we might have multiple perpetrators and multiple victims. So it can get actually complicated. The, the, the notion that intimate partner violence is always one perpetrator, one victim, um, in my experience, and, and I think um, yours as well, um, is uh, not typically the case. We often have uh, many people we're concerned about. So the last step then, you know, in our process, and this is what we have, want to train people to think about, is how do we then link the risk management plans uh, to, uh, to our scenarios, to our identified risk factors. So we're going to target the relevant risk factors. Uh, you know, if, if it's substance abuse, we're going to try to make some recommendations about how to manage that. If, uh, if it's an uh, issue about static security for the victim, uh, security around her home or workplace, we're going to try to ad address that. Uh, we want to specify, specific, uh, be as specific as possible as we can, uh, tailor our plans to individual cases. Every case is different. Uh, the strategies, I can't say the word strategies at 8.30 in the morning, um, but uh, they should be feasible, practical, and contextual. So you can go through a laundry list of, and ask for the world in your uh, risk, assess, risk management uh, recommendations and say, you know, you should be getting this world-class treatment and she should be getting all these support. But if we don't have the resources, it's really kind of a useless recommendation to make. So we always ask you to think, you know, let's, let's stick to reality. Let's make recommendations that are actually practical and useful. 
And the, the last uh, point here is that you know, whenever possible, we should be linking a risk management strategy to uh, an individual or agency. So somebody has to own it. Somebody has to take ownership for the intervention. Or again, it's kind of useless. It, the reports will just drift. Nobody will read them. So who's responsible for what? Um, and a multi-agency approach, I think, is, is the way to go. I mentioned in the ICAT uh, teams here, uh, just it's the, it's the uh, multi-agency approach that I know the best uh, that's used in a lot of communities in BC. Um, Debbie Hamilton, who uh, was instrumental in developing these things, we work together. Um, and uh, I think that kind of approach where everybody can, if you can get through the information sharing protocols and sit together and identify the high risk cases and work together, identify who's doing what, that's, that's the way to go. I understand it's not always practical, uh, but uh, uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, we have to be aspirational here, try to get to the point where we can do that. Uh, but it, I understand it's not always practical. So the strategies, I, I, I'm running out, I've run out of time, but the strategies that uh, we would say, this is a, a risk management plan. If we can't address these four areas, we haven't actually got a risk management plan in place. We have to think about monitoring strategies, very active monitoring, um, supervision, what controls, restrictions are we gonna place on that perpetrator, what treatment or rehabilitation uh, recommendations we're going to make for the perpetrator and how are we going to enhance the victim's safety. Not any one person or agency can do all this. That's why the multi-agency approach is really important. Uh, agencies need to communicate about what they're doing uh, and uh, I honestly believe that's the, uh, the best way we can go with this. Um, so we, I'm really blowing it, I'm sorry, but we actually have um, direct prompts, questions to ask about those four areas um, and uh, to remind people what the goal is, what the ultimate task is, and that is risk management. We should really just call it risk management. I think that's a better term for what we're trying to do here. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to start um, by acknowledging the work that I've done over the past five years with uh, Dr. Margaret Jackson, who is here with us. Um, we've worked over five years on looking at issues surrounding family violence, um, primarily in um, family law cases, and that led to an article that's on your screen published in uh, a Canadian journal just this last uh, spring called Family Violence and Involving Judicial Roles, Judges as Equality Guardians in Family Law Cases. Um, that, uh, that report and what I'll speak about involved, uh, two research studies were involved in. So what I'm um, saying uh, will also reflect uh, Margaret's views. So I do want to say, and, and you'll know this, that there are wonderful judges across the country who care deeply about family law and the challenges of uh, that domestic violence uh, pose, and they work very hard to address those issues. I'm speaking about concerns relating to courts as institutions. Um, our research shows that there, there um, may be concerns in our judicial system uh, in that we may be applying outdated traditional approaches uh, to judicial accountability and responsibility and qualifications to the needs of our modern justice um, system, uh, which makes judges accountable to women and children um, as guardians of our constitutional values, and in particular, the fundamental value of equality that's found, as you will know, in our charter and and uh, other human rights instruments. So um, we concluded that uh, doing um, this may increase the risk of harm to women and children in three ways. The first one uh, would be lack of relevant information 
provided to judges about domestic violence and risk. The second one is that uh, there may be inadequate qualifications of some judges to uh, actually assess domestic violence and risk. And the third one is the separate or siloed operation of, of court processes in these cases um, between uh, family and uh, criminal proceedings, and it can also include child protection uh, proceedings. Uh, so um, in the time I have, I will just touch on these four topics. What do I mean by a traditional justice system? Uh, what are the requirements of a constitutionally enhanced um, family justice system? Our two studies and their findings and then our recommendations. So um, by a traditional justice system, and I'm talking about one that's developed more than a hundred years ago, uh, it's one where judges are viewed as neutral arbiters. In other words, they only decide cases based on the evidence that usually uh, lawyers um, provide to them. They're not specialized. Uh, so I use the example on the screen um, where you can have a judge who the day before the judge was appointed uh, specialized in corporate mergers, and then the day after the judge is appointed, he or she hears a, a, a family law uh, case. Uh, judicial education isn't uh, in, in that system mandatory, and courts uh, operate separately or in silos. The uh, the modern uh, situation that we have, judges do have responsibilities to uh, incorporate uh, equality principles into their decision making. And in order to do that, and we've been hearing about that yesterday and this morning, they have to have in-depth, up-to-date understandings about equality principles, including discrimination uh, presently and in the past uh, against um, women and children, and they need to understand the complex, multifaceted um, nature of domestic violence, its impact, and as we've been discussing, how it should be addressed. Um, so equality is a fundamental constitutional value and I, I won't go over this but on your screen are some of the, some of the uh, equality values found in the the charter that specifically um, apply uh, to women and children and speaking about children as a vulnerable group the, as, as many of you will know, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which Canada ratified just over 25 years ago, uh, says children have the human right to be protected from violence of all kinds, to have decisions about their best interests made by qualified professionals, which obviously um, includes uh, judges, and to have decisions made without delay in child-friendly uh, processes. Um, another important issue is uh, what I've called judicial aptitude, judging without bias using equality values. And uh, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin um, makes the, I'm sure, obvious point, and she's speaking in the quote that I have on the screen to judges, saying that judges obviously, like everybody else, possess uh, preferences, convictions, and yes, uh, prejudices, and so they need to deal with those and address them, uh, and uh, they need to do that understanding equality principles. Uh, so, uh, summary of the, uh, the research, uh, I just need to give you a little bit of background about the British Columbia Family Law Act, which, which formed uh, the, the basis of our research. Um, we, we got this new legislation uh, passed in 2011 and effective March 2013. Uh, it's quite a good piece of legislation which uh, takes into account many of the risk factors that we've been talking about, hearing about here, and says that judges must consider a number of very specific risk factors relevant to 
identifying domestic violence and uh, specific factors relating to the risk of harm, and it very specifically says judges must consider other relevant um, criminal and civil proceedings. So also uh, by way of, of uh, background, and again, as many of you will um, know, in uh, British Columbia and many other places across the country, we don't have specialized judges. Uh, judges hear all sorts of uh, cases. Today, uh, for the most part, judicial education is not mandatory uh, for judges, and today, in most places, and there are some notable exceptions, courts continue to operate in silos. So our first uh, study uh, was back in 2012. It was a community consultation with 42 uh, people and institutions supporting women, and they identified a number of concerns relating to the the three areas we have identified, but most of them uh, were pretty um keen about the Family Law Act and thought it would make a difference. So um, Dr. Jackson and I decided some three years later to, to do a follow-up um, study, and it was exploratory and qualitative, and it, uh, uh, in, in it we spoke to lawyers uh, and uh, nine judges who helpfully met with uh, us from the British Columbia Provincial Court and Supreme Court. And um, the, uh, the results between the, the first study and the second one were strikingly similar. And uh, lack of information about dom domestic violence and risk was, uh, was among the concerns. The judges as a group said, as you can see, uh, it's uncommon. Um, uh, that they're provided with information about the risk of future um, harm. And individual judges, as you can see, say that it's sometimes a challenge to muster even a, a basic case, and sometimes uh, lawyers uh, uh, devalue or don't emphasize risk in these cases. Uh, most of the judges uh, said they would not ask for information if it isn't required. So this would specifically deal with whether they would ask for information about the factors for domestic violence and risk in the Family Law Act. They said they wouldn't because that's not their job. Uh, they see themselves, those judges, more as neutral arbiters and they said they often have to put blinders uh, on. Um, so qualifications, I'll go through this fairly quickly given the time that I have left, but there were concerns the lawyers and the community consultation people raised about judges and their qualifications, and in particular, uh, the issue of judges' qualifications in judicial dispute resolution um, meetings uh, where, where judges sometimes started with a presumption of joint parenting without even knowing the particular circumstances of the uh, family. Um, and then the uh, siloed court proceedings issue uh, was a huge one in the community consultation part. Um, the judges were very clear that they, uh, they uh, didn't usually know about other court proceedings. One judge said there can even be two proceedings in the same courthouse. Uh, and um, one judge made the, the, the point that the fact that there haven't been more cases of serious injury or death due to conflicting court orders is more due to good luck than uh, good management. Um, so recommendations, quickly, they won't surprise you. Uh, we say that judges to be accountable to the people that the justice system serves need to uh, take on a judicial oversight role by asking the appropriate questions. They don't have to become advocates for one side or the other. They can ask questions in a neutral way that's fair to everyone. Um, we think that judges in this area need to be specialized for the reasons that I have uh, highlighted. Um, 
And uh, we know that back in 2013, the um, Canadian National Action Committee on Access to Justice actually recommended that we have specialized judges. And uh, hopefully, they said, in, uh, in unified family courts. Um, with respect to um, the coordination of courts. Back in 2013, there was an important study by the Federal Provincial Territorial Working Group on Family Violence that made some recommendations about how these issues can uh, be dealt with. Uh, and the judges made some practical suggestions, which uh, I won't have time to go through, but the slides um, will be uh, available um, to you. So in the last, just very short, um, according to my timer, one minute and 31 seconds that I have left. Uh, I will just leave you with these thoughts. The National Action Committee on Access to Civil and Family Justice is led by judges, and they have made important recommendations, and three of them are these. The need to focus not just on access to justice, but on just outcomes. The need for the legal profession to undergo a cultural shift. Uh, a new way of thinking, and third, the need for action, not just words. It's, uh, those, that was said in 2013. It's almost 2018. While much good reform work is being done, unless we address these fundamental structural concerns, we're still caught up in an old way of thinking which creates an unacceptable chance that courts may increase rather than address the risk of harm or death to women and children leading to unjust outcomes. With such high stakes, we cannot yet again postpone to another day dealing with these pressing issues. The time for action is now. Thank you. As I said before, when I've been here in Canada, I barely got past the buttons on an elevator, so all these machines are, are quite the challenge for me. Thanks for inviting me very much indeed. I appreciate it. I want to just um, uh, talk about where we've been with fatality review. Um, I direct the National Domestic Violence Death Review Initiative in the United States and have been involved um, with work here with Peter in Canada and many other people, uh, folks in Portugal and uh, the UK and Australia and New Zealand as well. So um, I've been doing this for a while and Peter gave me a chance to reflect on this. So um, I want to talk about where we've been, what the challenges are and um, future directions maybe suggested by some of the work that we've done. So to put us all on the same page, We've got this operational definition of uh, domestic violence fatality review teams, or what we call um, in Canada homicide uh, review teams. And these teams are basically designed to identify um, those deaths caused by, related to, or somehow traceable to domestic violence. And they're also um, uh, designed to analyze those deaths um, quite meticulously and systematically. Um, with a view to developing preventive interventions. There's a lot of range, a lot of activities these teams do. There's tremendous variation, um, you know, so it's hard to encapsulate what we've done um, really over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, the methodologies vary. Teams vary in their resources. Um, sometimes we have... Um, uh, academics uh, involved in this work, um, some of whom uh, occasionally, like myself, suffer from academentia. So um, uh, when, when academics are involved, they'll tell you things like we have to produce scientific samples or representative samples or this or that. This is very difficult with this work because there's so much missing data. Um, there is a clear politic to case selection in some uh, jurisdictions in the United States. Um, there is also the threat, and I think it's um, a common threat, of trying to impose a grid of understanding uh, on the cases before we even start reviewing the cases. In other words, there's an attempt sometimes by some, whether they be uh, this ilk or that ilk or this kind of methodologist or that, this kind of political persuasion or that, to explain the deaths in certain ways, in certain terms, and that too is problematic. It's right putting the cart before the horse. So we've been there, we've been through some of those things. Um, there are clearly um, many problems obtaining information with the missing data issue. But there are also concerns around confidentiality and privacy and what we share. And our bottom line is that we want to do no harm. 
And, and that's a really important thing I think that we've learned. We've learned that team membership will be inclusive and creative, um, bringing folks in from all walks of life who have been touched by these cases. Um, ideally, we have um, at our heart the study of ways of life, ways, ways people live their lives, particularly we want to recreate the case through the eyes of the victim, ultimately the decedent, and others who were involved in the case. We want to involve family members, surviving family, community members, co-workers, friends, maybe even neighbor, neighbors or others. We also want to run our analyses, our reviews of these cases sometimes when we collect aggregate data through community groups, um, perhaps groups of battered women who understand what's going on in systems to run those recommendations by those folks. So we introduce over the years, and a number of review teams in the US have done this, sort of community feedback loops. So again, we've been there, we recognize the virtues of doing that as we work teams. It's very clear from both the research literature and the homicide review literature, that intimate partner homicide is profoundly gendered. This is something that men mostly commit, direct that, be that behavior at women. Um, there are cases, obviously, where women commit homicides. In many of those cases, women are prior victims of battering, but not always. But clearly, there are other trends here that we have to pay attention to. Um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be forwarding these things. Okay, you told me that wouldn't work, Peter, right? Okay, so um, so this, this, the social patterning, this is an anecdotal observation from 20 years of work, but I think it's fair to say that roughly half these cases involve victims, decedents ultimately, who do not come to the attention of systems in general. In other words, they have no contact with agencies. Those folks die in isolation or relative isolation. And then there are probably another roughly half of the cases where victims have substantial contact with systems, but those systems had very little collaboration, communication, coordination of their activities regarding the case. And we've heard that here already at the conference today with some of the stories and the case histories. So it's very clear that We've got a lot of work to do in terms of missed opportunities, but we've at least established that there are those um, patterns. But these are stylized killings. We know this. There are patterns to them. There are antecedents. Some have framed these as risk markers. Um, but nevertheless, um, our risk literature in some ways parallels our fatality review literature. So when we read the reports and we read the risk literature, um, pioneers like Randy and Jackie have done this work, we do see similarities and that too is encouraging, that sort of corroboration. Um, it's important too to face the fact that sometimes women kill men in situations where those women are aggressors, um, where they themselves may be um, batterers, where they themselves um, may have been subject to biographies of victimization in the past, just as male perpetrators themselves sometimes are. So these are important issues to bear in mind. Now, why isn't that going? There we go. There's Mark Twain. And this is a rather vulgar quote, but I like it. Most people, Mark Twain said, most people use statistics like a drunk man, and we should bold man, uses a lamppost more for support than illumination. Now, what did he mean by that? What do I use that for? The, if we listen to the statisticians and the politicians, they'll tell us that over the last 20 or 30 years, the intimate partner homicide rate has declined. And that's true. These are eminently countable statistics because we often, not always because of the missing cases, we often are able to count relatively easily. So we might be misled by that graph into thinking that things are improving. They may be, but they may not be. The same we see here in Canada with the relative decline from 1993. 
I'm going to talk now a little bit about some general changes, if I can get this to line up, which I can't. OK, there we go. So some folks have looked very specifically at what death review teams have done and tried to track changes that have been introduced because of fatality review activities. Some research in Washington documented changes made um, in providing services for battered women, for example, with limited English proficiency because of some killings that occurred in that state. Likewise, police had introduced screening to um, detect suicidal abusers, and knowing full well that if they're suicidal, there is a threat of homicide to those around them. There are other specific changes that we have listed up on our website, which is ndvfri.org, which you can see. There are various cards that people have produced to track offenders um, called the HOPE card, which is fairly well known in the United States. It's just a card with a coded message and order of protection that um, folks can carry around with them rather like a credit card. There are numerous systems changes that have been made um, as a result of fatality review. And again, if you go to our website, you read the reports, or you go to the Canadian website, you can see the kinds of changes that have been made. But it's very difficult for us to track those changes, and we'll see that when I talk about this a little bit later. So what challenges do we face? What can we take away from this work? Um, the, the first thing that we need to say is that fatality review, homicide review is a methodology. It's a way of knowing. If we do it in conjunction with community work, then clearly we can build community, we can build intervention and coordination through the process of reviewing the case. So there is that organic activity of reviewing and coming together around an emotionally charged issue. But fatality review cannot clearly compensate for these various socio-historical horrors that we've been hearing about over the last couple of days. You know, there's no way that it can compensate for the horrors, the terrors of, for example, colonization of indigenous peoples, both here in the United States or indeed elsewhere. It's not going to um, be able to deal with issues related to the globalization of capitalism, automation, you know, the rise of bureaucracies, disenchanting bureaucracies. These are huge social changes that the review teams will perhaps detect in the work that they do, but can do directly little about. So there are limits to what review activity can do. And these things, these developments, these massive economic developments affect ta tax bases and they affect infrastructures. The way we organize economies, the way we tax and redistribute or maldistribute wealth, if you like, are critically important for battered women and their families. Those are conscious political choices. And again, teams reflecting on those and informing those decisions might be useful, but to date, teams haven't being able to see those as anything other than challenges. Now, when we look at trends in the United States, it's very clear that the steepest declines have been in marginalized communities, particularly in the inner city. African-American males have been the principal beneficiaries, along with, to a lesser extent, African-American females, in terms of the lowering of the homicide rates. But we also need to factor in medical advances changes in emergency medical services. And I'm going to get there in just a moment. It's very clear that the development of community policing brought emergency services, emergency medical services, to the inner city in the United States in a much faster way. We think that's lowered the death rate significantly at the same time as perhaps um, creating higher rates of aggravated assault. That's what the data seems to suggest. Now, some research has shown that without those rapid medical interventions, and the research of Harris et al. published in 02 originally addresses this, we need more research. 
It's very clear that the 15 to 20,000 homicides in the US in general, not intimate partner homicides, but homicides, would have been 45 to 70,000 without those medical interventions. And Harris et al. reckoned that about 25 to 4.5% um, improvement in the homicide rate or artificial lowering of the homicide rate occurs every year because of the rise of things like trauma centers and these effects. So we've got better at saving lives, we haven't necessarily become more peaceful or pacified or self-controlled. The CDC data in the US supports this. We know this is a major challenge. If you look at the CDC data from 2001 through 2011, it's clear that roughly those, um, those people wounded seriously enough by gunshots to require either a hospital stay, some kind of a hospital stay as opposed to treatment or release, rose almost by half over that decade. So these are cautionary notes for us. And when we look at the British research, Sylvia Wolby's research, which we need to replicate in um, other uh, democratic societies that have um, the statistical capacity to do this, it's clear from Wolby's research, which was published in the British Journal of Crim in 2015, that the practice of capping multiple assaults, and the Brits cap them at five, in other words, you don't count over five, when you, when you actually count the real number of assaults, violence against women in the UK has actually increased significantly since the 08 recession. And we see the same thing in the United States, even with the familicides. So these are causes for concern too. These are challenges. Other challenges that we have are clearly related to the outcomes, potential outcomes of fatality review work. We don't know the effect of review work. What we need is to know, I think, about at least 10 things and maybe more. We need to know how review team recommendations are implemented, how that gets done, what the machinery of implementation is, what effect that has and whether that's contributed to by other social change agents as well. We need to document changes in law and law-like systems, systems of rules. We need to document team expansion. We need to document public education and awareness and track this concerning domestic violence. We need to measure the more ethereal things that are more difficult to track, things like shifts in what I call the three C's, communication, coordination, collaboration of resources. Working together seems to hold out a lot of hope, and I'll address that when I conclude, perhaps more hopefully. Um, we need to get this sense of how fatality review or other C coordinated community responses change the level of integration and the focus, the train of the gaze of the state on these um, uh, disturbing cases. We also need to track rates of IPV, IPH, and other DV-related deaths, including the suicides. I mean, we suspect that um, we lose more women, better women to suicide a year exiting violent relationships than we do to homicide. And this is a reality. We need to get to grips with that. So we need to track those changes, bearing in mind, too, controlling for the impact of medical interventions. Um, I think, too, we need to look at the way resource mobilization occurs, and this, too, is a challenge. How do we garner more resources to do the vital work that we need? We've heard a lot about um, the deprivation um, of uh, resources, the dearth of resources in Aboriginal and remote and rural communities in this conference. We need to focus more carefully on that and how we can use reviews to um, argue for, cogently argue for more resources. More difficult to document, but nevertheless important to document, are things like attitudinal shifts and even actual behavioral changes in relationships that may reflect um, changes in people's behavior, the way, that, you know, the, way the system has worked uh, to encourage different forms of intimacy. And then we obviously also need to look at fatality review teams' links to government and the machinery of changing things at legislative levels. And then finally, I think, exploring the links between fatality review and risk assessment and how they comport with each other or don't and some of the issues related to risk assessment. So I'd like to say also now a few words about um, 
future directions. And I'm going to focus on four things. I'm going to focus on new questions or issues, surviving children, working with perpetrators, and the virtues of working together. And I'm actually wrestling with three screens here because I'm getting a pop-up menu here as well. So I want you to know how sophisticated this actually is, um, if I may be so bold. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm now wrestling with a fourth um, form of interference. Thank you, Marcy. Um, so uh, questions that come up all the time. I, I review cases frequently. I go to communities. I still serve on the uh, Indian Country Review team up in Montana. I've been a, a member since we formed that team. Um, why doesn't he leave? What about the emotional condition of perpetrators? What about problematic notions of control? The notion of control is problematic. I don't care for the concept, I have to say, of coercive control, because to me it implies control is realized. And I've quizzed Evan Stark on this, and he still won't answer my question. But basically, to imply that women are totally controlled is to fly in the face of the resistive maneuverability of women that we see all the time in death reviews, right to the end, that desire to survive and to work things through for them and their kids. So these are complicated questions. Um, we, we have to deal with the shame and humiliated fury of perpetrators and the links between that and power and control. No one's saying that these men don't feel powerful or entitled or privileged, but they also are deeply humiliated often. Large numbers of intimate terrorists are deeply humiliated by who they are as men. And we have to begin to wrestle with some of these issues. Um, you know, people tell us that anger management and anger is less important and peripheral or derivative of the power and control dynamic. Um, my, under, my read of these cases is that anger is central um, as an emotion and that as an articulated behavior related to that, the aggressiveness that goes with um, uncontrolled anger is also important. We have somehow to think about those things. Um, we have to challenge issues about it. women's syndrome, cycles of violence, learned helplessness, the stock scripts that don't recognize the complexity in bad women's lives, decedents' lives, even men's lives who um, die in these cases. It's more complicated than that. We deal with issues of mental illness, with drug abuse. Um, these are very difficult issues to weave into the fabric of a simplistic power and control wheel. It's too crude and it's too inflexible. I now want to move on and say a few words about kids. Three or 4,000 kids a year in the United States are orphaned in these cases. Many of those kids see the deaths, clean up the blood, deal with the crime scenes. Fatality review teams know that those kids exist. We've known that for 20 years. But systematically, it's not been their job to address this. So in Arizona, one thing we did this year well, uh, not this year, three years ago actually, and Peter's been involved in this, um, is to launch our Arizona Child and Adolescent Survivor Initiative, where we are now providing wraparound services, um, intensive grief counseling for the complex issues the kids deal with, um, uh, mentorship programs, material support, victims of crime act support, legal support, um, estate planning support, etc., and plus peer support groups for those kids. We're now serving 70 children in the state of Arizona and roughly 70 new caregivers who've assumed the responsibilities of working with those children, caring for those children. And we have a number of other states in the US that are interested in doing this. We would love to set up a national initiative to do this. It's very important work. This is one of the things, one of the challenges I think that we face. Those kids, as you know, um, experience um, complicated trauma. Um, uh, they have many, many uh, aspects to their life from nightmares, flashbacks, headaches, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are the things we're dealing with with the kids. Tense feelings of shame, suicidality, etc. We have to deal with perpetrators. Perpetrators suffer a lot of trauma in their lives. We need to interview perpetrators when we do death reviews, and we need to realize, as James uh, Gilligan, James Garbarino point out in their wonderful work, that these guys experience trauma too. We want to focus on trauma. We've got to focus on perpetrators and work with them, bearing in mind that some of them claim amnesia and some of them genuinely suffer from dissociative amnesia. 
and I will talk too about, um, at other times, uh, men I've interviewed over the years. I've only interviewed probably 40 or 50 people who've killed in prison, and I have to say, um, I see that commonly. It's very sad. Um, so let's, let's, let's get to the positive now that Peter asked me to address. Um, first of all, um, when, you go to the, uh, when you go in for a medical procedure, they may tell you that you've got a 0.01 chance of some uh, negative outcome occurring. They won't tell you in the United States that a quarter of a million people die from preventable medical errors every year. They won't tell you that. Now, Randy showed a picture of his puppy today, so I had to show... Um, I had to be contrary, and I wanted to show a radioactive wolf from the Chernobyl area, just to sort of play out the binary. So I'm a man of binaries too, I guess. You know, Chernobyl happened, and there's a thousand mile, square mile plus exclusion zone because the Soviets didn't talk with each other, they didn't work together. They knew for 20 years they had a lot of accidents, they didn't review them. There were mishaps, small errors build to large errors. So we've got errors in medicine, we've got errors in the nuclear fuel industry, and then we have aircraft crashes. Chesley Sullenberger landed that plane on the Hudson River eight years ago after he flew his plane into a flock of geese and he landed it successfully. And I found this lovely quote from him, I'm fighting with my pop-up menu again, but he said, you take a team of experts and you make them an expert team. That's why aviation safety is so, so much further advanced than that in medicine and nuclear power because they listen to each other. The pilot has an interest in doing that because they're gonna go down with the plane, I get that. The medical folks have problems with lawsuits, but the folks talk to each other in aviation and if we can talk to each other doing fatality review, we can do something about these tragedies. I want to close, because Marcy is going to get to me in just a second. There she goes again, another pop-up. I want to close with a quote from Adlai Stevenson, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and a tribute uh, to Eleanor Roosevelt after she died. I have lost more than a beloved friend. I've lost an inspiration. She would rather light a candle than curse the darkness, and her glow has warmed the world. So is it not possible that if we can do our review work well, with respect, through the complex lens of the lives of lost loved ones, and in homage to them, that we can warm the world a little? Do we not owe victims at least that, and indeed much, much more? Thank you. Actually, it's really important to think about the world of domestic violence uh, through the eyes of children. And actually, this is a, a picture that's actually was done for a book cover. This is, uh, I have four boys. This is actually two of my boys. Uh, stage picture, this is uh, Aaron when he was uh, five and Daniel when he was two with an officer specializing in domestic violence. And, wanted just to get the perspective from a child's world. What does it look like when an officer comes to your house? Uh, again, this was staged, it wasn't my house, it wasn't a domestic violence incident, but it, it really gets you thinking about how confusing the world must look and the kinds of decisions that children are faced with uh, when they live with domestic violence. Actually, one of our, uh, we were talking uh, earlier session about safety planning and uh, Laura, um, some of you met who uh, was doing interviews with key informants talked about one northern community that she spoke to and they talked about a three-year-old who actually work, walked to the shelter, a three-year-old walked to the shelter themselves to find safety and support because uh, that was part of uh, her safety plan and something she had done before. So when we think about the challenges for kids, uh, they're absolutely enormous and overwhelming and uh, we can't forget about the kids. We know that from death review committee work across, uh, uh, across the world that about 10 to 20 percent of domestic homicide victims, in fact, are children. Uh, those who survive, uh, many uh, will be eyewitnesses to horrific trauma, uh, and very few of them get ongoing support. It was so nice to hear Neil talking about uh, his project in Arizona and making sure that we do provide ongoing support for children 
who've been so horribly traumatized uh, and have uh, lifelong uh, challenges. Uh, sometimes, uh, as many of you may know from uh, stories within your own communities, sometimes children have lost one or both parents uh, and children are then caught in subsequent custody fights uh, between the maternal and paternal families. And there's obviously, uh, years ago we had uh, an international story from the US about O.J. Simpson. After he killed his uh, ex-partner, there was a custody fight uh, between uh, the maternal grandparents and O.J. Simpson. Uh, and if you can think about this, just to reflect on the challenges in doing this work, O.J. Simpson was found responsible for the murder in a civil court. So on balance of probability, he was found responsible for killing the children's mother, yet the family court in Los Angeles gave him joint custody of his children together with the maternal grandparents. They were supposed to work together, the maternal grandparents uh, and O.J. Simpson. So just think about uh, some of the decisions, and again, I'm not, uh, obviously I'm not generalizing to all courts and all judges, uh, but it's just overwhelming to think uh, about some of those cases and what they mean in terms of our, our ignorance and lack of awareness about uh, domestic violence and domestic homicide. Children are killed in the context of domestic violence uh, through death review reports indirectly by attempting to protect one parent, uh, save one parent uh, during a violent episode. Um, uh, they might be killed as part of an overall murder-suicide plan or they're killed as an act of revenge. Uh, when she leaves and he loses control, uh, and in many cases there, is, there are issues uh, of control, uh, the best way to get back at her is to uh, harm uh, the people most precious to her, uh, which are her children. So those are things that we can't forget about the circumstances and obviously the work of the death review committees uh, are so important to remind us about these tragedies. Um, when we think about what we need to know, um, although we're, this conference is about domestic homicide, uh, for many of us, uh, many of your friends and neighbors and colleagues, not those of you who are in the room, um, but many of the people you work with still have, double, has, still have trouble recognizing how children are actually harmed by domestic violence. Uh, never mind getting to the topic of homicide, just the impact of growing up with violence, the, uh, the short-term, the long-term emotional, psychological harm to children. Um, I started doing work in this area 35 years ago. Uh, actually, the, uh, I worked with a colleague, David Wolf and uh, Susan Wilson, and uh, the first shelter that ever accepted us uh, was, uh, director was Joy Lang, who's still with us at the back of the room, still with our organization. Uh, and we were able to do work 35 years ago looking at the impact of domestic violence on children. I wrote a number of articles with my colleagues and published a book. And I remember sending um, the book home to my mother in Montreal. And um, I talked to her every Sunday. And I sent her the book uh, early in the week. And I remember calling her and I said, Mom, did you read the book? And she said, yeah, I read the book. What about it? And I said, um, well, what do you think about some of the research and some of the findings? And I still remember what, uh, what she said to me. She said, I can't believe you need a PhD to do this stuff. This is like common sense. Like you actually have to do research uh, to show that it's harmful for children to grow up in homes with violence. Um, like, and again, I think she was inspiring me to do better research and writing and, uh, and move on to more variables or complex interactions. Uh, perhaps look more at intersectionality. I'm not sure what she had in mind for me. Uh, but I was always reminded by that, so whenever I called her, and I did visit regularly too, but whenever I called her, I told her about all the stories, I told her about all the times that things that looked so obvious to her, because she said to me, I could have told you this before you did the research, your grandmother could have told you this, why do you actually have to prove that children are harmed by being exposed to domestic violence? And I t told her over and over again, uh, I go to court on a regular basis, you know, and I try to explain you know, the, the toxic environment, living with violence, the trauma children have experienced. And I, I run across judges who say to me, I still remember a court case I had where the judge said, well, did he ever lay a hand on the kids? And I said, no, Your Honor, you don't have to lay a hand on kids to harm them. 
Uh, growing up with terror and trauma is itself a form of harm, and you don't have to lay a hand on kids to harm them. So I mention that just because I hear over and over again people who ask that question. Um, every week I hear from somebody, a lawyer, another professional, who, said, who says, well, he didn't lay a hand on the kids. This isn't about child abuse, this is about domestic violence, an adult issue, how are children involved. So I, I mentioned that part, Justice Martinson made the point really well, that sometimes we have judges who do corporate commercial work one day, the next day they're a judge in family court, dealing with difficult cases, so we can't assume knowledge with any of our colleagues across all, uh, all sectors. Uh, we have to go, obviously, recognizing the harm to children is a starting point, is a foundation, but then we also have to look at specific risks that children may face. We have to be actively involved in including children in, in safety planning and, uh, and obviously risk management. Uh, but beyond that, we have to collaborate. And one of the reasons we have to collaborate is all the different agencies that are involved. Uh, in an Ontario study looking at children killed in the context of domestic violence, on average there was nine different agencies involved. Well, the children killed in the context of domestic violence, on average there was nine agencies involved uh, with the family. So you had uh, teachers, you had court systems, often people wor working in child protection, um, you had anti-violence agencies, everybody had a piece of the puzzle. Uh, teachers had a piece of the puzzle. Teachers uh, often see the aftermath of violence uh, within their homes, so teachers, uh, both pre-service and ongoing professional development, need a lot of information about being aware of the aftermath of violence and how children are going to be affected at every age and stage of development. So clearly, uh, we need to have people working much more closely together. This is not the work of one agency. Uh, this, is the, this is the work of multiple professionals and multiple agencies who have to f find a way to, uh, to come together. And, and it's really inspiring to hear some of the work uh, coming out of BC, some of the innovative work uh, where collaboration is really happening at a much deeper level than, than ever before. Um, looking ahead, um, why is there so much struggle in our progress? Why, why is there such a gap between what we know and what we're actually doing? And I, there's many points, and you've, you've heard them throughout the last two days. Uh, first and foremost, there's still a lack of basic awareness. Um, there's a lack of training of even including children uh, when we think about safety planning. And some of, the, some of the things I know that Linda Baker talked about yesterday, some of the things that we need to be aware of and, and, uh, and there's no excuse anymore why we're not aware of these issues. Um, how to deal with our own uh, burnout and vicarious trauma, how to manage it, uh, not prevent it, it may not be preventable, but at least it may be manageable uh, through the work we do together. And I certainly always come away from a conference like this feeling better, knowing that there's uh, some really exciting, innovative things that are, that are taking place. What do we do to have better standards? And I just picked one example. Uh, we now have formal guidelines for people involved in child custody evaluations about recognizing domestic violence as an important factor uh, and some of the guidelines in terms of developing appropriate parenting plans after separation when we know there's domestic violence. The last point I just want to focus on is the uh, having genuine collaboration. How do we actually get people working together? And I'll just share with you uh, uh, the, what lack of collaboration means. One of the first cases that I had a chance to review at the uh, Death Review Committee, uh, when the committee first began, we actually invited survivors uh, to come forward and tell their story in several of the meetings. And we had a uh, survivor woman whose uh, daughter had been killed by her ex-partner. And she told everybody how dangerous she thought he was. And she told our committee a story. She said, you know, I went to the second floor of the courthouse that dealt with criminal cases, and I had such an incredible experience. There was a police officer who was uh, a domestic violence specialist. There was a Crown attorney who was a domestic violence specialist. I got referred to victim services working with the Crown. I had a safety plan. I had a whole wraparound services around me. Uh, the level of service I had was absolutely incredible. I then had to go to the third floor in the same courthouse into the family court where I met a judge 
who said to me that if I was going to have, to cust if I was going to have custody, my job was to be a friendly parent. My job was to promote contact uh, with the other parent, with my ex-partner. said in the second floor I had a safety plan. On the third floor they gave me a danger plan and they told me that in order to keep custody I was going to have to promote contact uh, with my ex-partner who I'd seen as very dangerous and she told us obviously a, a fairly detailed background. And she talked about how predictable and how preventable uh, what she experienced was and her voice always remains me, it haunts me in terms of the experiences that she had uh, that no one should ever have, no one should ever be put into a court system that's so broken and disorganized and uncoordinated. Uh, our children and our adult victims uh, and survivors deserve a lot better. So when we talk about collaboration, I want you to remember that story and I want to make sure whatever happens on the second floor in your building, people know about in the third floor that they're sharing information, that they're sharing information that comes from risk assessment tools, that they're doing their very best in terms of, uh, in terms of safety planning and risk management, and that we continue to, to save lives. Let me just, uh, I'm going to move from my presentation to wrapping up the conference um, because uh, our time is, is drawing to uh, close, so I'm going to take advantage of being here, and Marcy's going to time me. I think I have half an hour for this part. Um, just uh, very briefly, first of all, I, I want to thank the panel. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Kathy Menard, um, who talked about herself being bossy. Uh, being bossy is very important. Kathy Menard has been a leader across the country. She, Kathy Menard, as a, as a chief coroner in North, Northwest Territories, actually put domestic violence, domestic homicide, on the agenda of the meetings of the chief coroners across the country uh, several years ago, uh, and has really been uh, a very strong advocate to make sure that we look at these deaths in great detail and consider what recommendations we can make to prevent tragedies and similar circumstances uh, in the future. Um, Neil has been an inspirational, uh, to be honest, and I'll be honest because our time is short, um, there's not much good coming out of the U.S. these days. Um, quite frankly, where most of us are afraid to turn on the television, afraid to turn to CNN. Uh, Neil Websdale is an exception, and you're welcome anytime over the border. Um, Neil has been, uh, he's donated his time to be here, uh, flown up from uh, Arizona. Uh, because of his passion and belief in this issue and he uh, works uh, across the world trying to get people to to do it right and he also asks really difficult questions he asks questions that are sometimes are uncomfortable but they're really important so i hope you keep asking those those questions uh, joanne i really appreciate uh, what you've done to provide a really strong voice not only for saskatchewan but uh, rural women who face domestic violence and i know you've had a, a very dramatic impact in your province i know when i read the Saskatchewan newspapers. Uh, people aren't forgetting domestic homicides. They're not buried in the back page. People are asking tough questions because of advocates like yourself. Uh, Tracy, all you do to advocate, and, and obviously all, I think all of us try to avoid burnout by being innovative, thinking how we can dig deeper, do a better job, and some of the models that you've presented uh, are, really, uh, are really important. And Claudette, uh, a lot of you may not know this, but uh, Claudette has been at this for many years. Uh, I traveled across the country with her from coast to coast to coast, 139 communities, uh, not all of them, but, but many of them, uh, 25 years ago addressing uh, these issues. And she's been at this work uh, for so many years and been so passionate. Uh, if you come up to ask her questions after the, uh, after the presentation, make sure you refer to her, to her as Dr. Dumont Smith. Uh, she leaves this conference tomorrow to go to Guelph to receive an honorary doctorate uh, to recognize uh, her tremendous work and contribution to the field. So, 